I'm going to talk about shade tolerance and warm season grasses. And the reason why I do this is because there's a constant battle uh, in the landscape. People like trees and people like lawns and turf grasses. And the problem is they do not coexist very well. And um, when there's a competition between a tree and a lawn grass, the tree always wins. Um, there's really no competition there. A tree is 30, 40 plus feet tall. The grass is a couple of inches tall. It's no surprise who wins for light. But I did want to point out a few things, which is all turf grasses, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a zoysia grass lawn in Birmingham, a Kentucky bluegrass lawn in Detroit, um, it is true that all turf grasses are full sun plants. Think about where you find turf grasses out in nature. It's not a forest understory plant. Grasses come in in the clearings where there's light hitting the ground. Um, they're the first uh, you know, colonizers after say a forest fire or some disturbance in the forest, but when the trees get tall enough to shade out the grasses, there they go. It is true that we do have some grasses that can tolerate a little bit of shade better than others do. And that's really what I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about. Um, in general, cool season grasses are less bad in the shade than warm season grasses, but uh, we are Alabama extension. And so this, I'm gonna make this uh, a very Alabama centric viewpoint. And we use mostly warm season grasses in Alabama, which are in general, the ones that are the uh, worst in the shade, unfortunately. Now, just to hammer home what I was saying before, if you look at a diagram of, of the dominant biomes in the country, the Southeast is really dominated by forests. Yes, we do have some clearings here and there where we, where we had some grasslands, but um, this is not really grass country, okay? Left to its own device, your lawn would probably end up becoming a forest and you would lose all the grass out of it. And that's just something to remember. Um, we don't have too many grasses uh, that we can use for turfs that are native to this region. So we end up importing a lot of them, even though the warm season ones. Now, I have mentioned before, warm season grasses and cool season grasses. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole too deeply on this, but I do want to mention that there is a basic physiological difference between warm season grasses, the types of grasses that we're gonna grow in Alabama. This is the group of grasses that includes Bermuda grass, zoysia grass, centipede grass, St. Augustine grass, uh, Bahia grass, seashore past palette, if you guys have heard of those grasses. The cool season grasses includes your typical Yankee grasses, okay? Blue grasses, bent grasses, fescues, uh, and rye grasses. Those are the main groups of cool season grasses that you'll see used really across most of the country. Um, but not here in the Southeast. It's just a little too hot for a little too long in the summertime. And uh, our cool season grasses can't really take that. And the difference is the way they do photosynthesis, I'm not gonna get into the mechanics of, of photosynthesis in plants, but I will say this, the, 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 the bottom line is our warm season grasses, the way they do photosynthesis takes more energy. And remember, where do plants get their energy from? Sunlight or light, okay? It's a more efficient way of doing photosynthesis when it's hot. Uh, it allows the plants to conserve water and therefore be more drought tolerant as well, but it takes more energy. And so therefore plants that come from generally tropical or subtropical climates where there tends to be an even amount of sunshine through the year, uh, the sun is at a high angle in the sky most of the year um, and it's hot and plants have to worry more about water loss. Uh, those are the environments that favor um, a C4 plant. A C3 plant is going to be generally favored by a more temperate environment. Um, it takes less energy to make a molecule of uh, glucose using the C3 pathway for photosynthesis. Um, and that's great, it means that those plants don't need as much light, um, but it's not as efficient or as drought tolerant. So in a warm environment, we generally see warm season grasses. That's great. They're much more drought tolerant. Um, and that's great, but they do need more energy, which means they need more sunlight. Now, how much do they actually need and what happens when they don't get it? We'll get into the um, how much do they need question here in a minute, but this is a great example of what happens when they don't get the light they need. So this is a lawn that is in heavy shade. You can probably see magnolia leaves on the ground here. There's magnolia branches right at the top there of the picture. There's a big old magnolia tree and other trees providing a lot of shade in this 
objects there. Now there's green stuff on the ground. And uh, from a distance, you might say, well, that doesn't look so bad. And uh, it may not be so bad, depending on what you want to use the lawn for. Now, this happened to be not a uh, private home, but a commercial um, area where they were doing things like um, meetings, events, weddings, that sort of thing on the lawn and other places. Um, and so that doesn't help, obviously. But what you find is in the heavy shade there, it's not grass. OK, so you, you get a close up. And it's mostly dichondra, which is this little broadleaf with the roundish leaves here. These needle-like um, leaved plants here. Those aren't actually grasses. That's probably yellow or purple nut sedge, some kind of a sedge. Um, there are some itty-bitty patches of the original zoysia grass that was sodded there, peeking through, but not too many. It's mostly been taken over by the sedges and the dichondra, the odd patch of some other kind of a weedy grass. And that's what's surviving in the uh, environment much, much better than the grass is. The only way you can fix this is to cut down some trees. So I say it as a joke a lot, or at least limb up some trees. You know, so I say it as a joke a lot, uh, but it's actually true. A lot of times the best tool you can use to increase the health of a lawn is a chainsaw. And uh, the problem is, of course, if you have a beautiful old magnolia tree shading part of a lawn where you want to have events, you probably don't want to cut that down for a number of different reasons, aesthetics, the, the coolness the shade provides. And so then we start talking about, well, what do we have that we can use as an alternative ground cover in really shady areas? And there are actually a lot of things that grow better under heavy shade uh, than turf grasses do. They usually don't have the major de uh, desirable characteristic of a turf grass, which is that you can cut it really short and it will take a lot of traffic. Okay, so for example, I mentioned dichondra. So here is out of that same lawn, another little corner here uh, that gets a lot of shade. And you can see it's, it's almost all dichondra right here. Um, and the dichondra is running, it has stolons, it will spread, but it doesn't have a very deep root system. So it's not very drought tolerant and it's not very tolerant of traffic. Uh, so if you have a lot of people walking across the dichondra lawn, it will rip up. We have ivy. Okay, ivy does great in the shade compared to a lot of other plants, but you can't mow it down really short and have an event on it. Uh, it hides snakes. Um, it uh, climbs up trees um, and can damage trees and buildings. So there's a lot of cons to something like ivy as well. We used to use a lot of Asiatic jasmine on our Auburn University campus underneath trees and such. We kind of got away from that. It's not a uh, it, it's pretty disease prone, doesn't tend to persist as a thick ground cover for us. We've just gone to pine straw on the Auburn University campus and mulch in some areas, but mostly pine straw where um, we don't want to keep fighting Mother Nature and keep trying to grow grass in areas where there's not enough light. If you look here in the back of this picture over by the driveway where there's a lot of sun, that's where the nice, thick, healthy zoysia grass is. So how much light do you actually need? When I first started working at Auburn, and this is probably what most people who, who work in the uh, landscape industry will tell you. Um, if you try to rank the shade tolerance of warm season grasses, you'll come up with a list that looks like this. And I intentionally use this terminology. I start out talking about the grasses that are worse in the shade and then ones that are not quite as bad and then less bad than that, rather than turning them around and telling you, oh, St. Augustine grass is a shade tolerant grass. I mean, it's okay in the shade for a grass, but it doesn't have the same shade tolerance as like an azalea bush or, or the English ivy or some of the mondo grasses, things like that. So I never like to say that such and such a grass loves the shade. That's terrible. No, no grass loves the shade. Okay. You won't find a sod farmer out there deliberately planting trees in a field of St. Augustine grass because St. Augustine grass loves the shade. It grows great in the full sun. All right. Uh, but it's less bad in the shade than most other grasses. So this was the, uh, this is our traditional ranking, Bermuda grass, very, very bad in the shade, seashore past palum, which is something that we see sometimes in Alabama, uh, particularly on sports fields and golf courses, not, not too much in lawns yet. Um, it's a grass they use a lot more of in Florida um, and South Texas than they do in Alabama because it's not very cold tolerant. You can't get it too far away from the coast and expect it to survive the winter. Uh, then we have zoysia grass and centipede grass as, as a little bit less bad in the shade. And then St. Augustine grass was always the go-to species of warm season grass if you happen to have shade. Uh, but there's been some advances in turf grass breeding lately. And there's been um, some development, especially within the zoysia grass. Newer varieties of zoysia grass tend to be 
more shade tolerant than older varieties. Okay, and one way you can measure this is to um, just use a light meter. Okay, so um, for example, Spectrum Technologies. I don't. Uh, they're not the only ones that uh, make these things. It's just the one that I happen to have a picture of there um, because I, I have some of these. Uh, they make a light meter that you can stick in the ground um, or use in a greenhouse. It you know works both places and um, if you leave it in the ground for 24 hours or more, it will um, give you a very rough reading. It's just got four LEDs here <laughs> that light up. Um, and it'll give you a rough idea of what we call the daily light integral, which is just a measure of the total amount of light energy that's fallen on this light meter um, in a 24 hour period. Okay. And units are uh, moles per square meter per day. That doesn't really matter. But what does matter is the higher the number, the higher the amount of light energy has fallen on that light meter over the past 24 hours. So you can stick these in the ground for 24 hours, pull them out, and get a little bit of, a, of an idea whether you have enough light to grow a, a given grass. So this is some data that's actually kind of old right now, but it's, it's showing the progress we've been making. So Tifway Bermuda grass right here is a very, very common uh, lawn grass, also used very often on golf courses and sports fields. It's, it's the... Um, still the standard uh, Bermuda grass in the Southeast. And I say still because this stuff was released in 1960. Okay, here we are 2022. This is still the vast majority of all the hybrid Bermuda grass in the state of Alabama. And you can see here that it's gonna require somewhere between in the spring and fall, a little bit less because it's not quite as hot, not growing as fast summertime, you know, 22 moles of uh, light energy per square meter per day. That's a lot. We look at some of the newer varieties of Bermuda grass, and we're seeing these numbers coming down a little bit. So less bad in the shade. Then when you get to centipede grass, we see numbers here of 14 and 13. Um, that's a lot less light. So this is this is going to be in most locations in Alabama to get a DLI of 20. You need to have about eight hours of uh, sunlight total, um, direct sun on a, on a given location. This is translating more to about six hours or so. And then we get down into the St. August Christine grass, you know, 11 or 0.6, 11.8. That's roughly more like four or five hours of direct sun. And some of the newer varieties that have come on the market, this is from 2012. There's some newer ones still that are down in this 11 to 12 range. Zoysia is just as uh, much shade tolerance as St. Augustine grasses. And so that's, that's given us some more options of grasses we can use if you're in a position to, you know, maybe you're planting a new area or if you're in a position to switch your grass, um, you may want to look at the newer zoysia grasses rather than the uh, old standbys like Meyer and, and Emerald. This is a picture that I just took in March of this year. It was before the trees leafed out, um, but it's showing you uh, what happens when you have, in this case, a legacy uh, a variety of zoysia grasses, Emerald zoysia grass uh, planted um, in a subdivision. This is um, just a street in a subdivision here in Auburn. And you can see on the right side there, uh, I, was, I was driving through this area, it was about 1.30 local time in March, so that's just after solar noon when we're on daylight savings time, and you can see where the shade problem is just by the outline of the tree branches. Of course, now that the trees have leaves, I, I, I need to go back out there and take a picture of, of the actual shade, but you can see where the problem is going to be, um, and you can tell how much thinner the grass is here than it is on the extreme right where it's getting a lot of sun or in, or in little pockets where it's, it's, it's getting more sun. This is an area where you should think about, you know, if this grass dies, which it probably will, either coming in, you might have enough light there, I doubt it, to try one of the newer varieties of zoysia, or you may just want to punt and bring on the pine straw, you know, and, and just have this area be pine straw, maybe put some more azaleas in there um, and just be done with grass. You know, I talked to the HOA president of this subdivision, and it's about a 15 to 20 year old subdivision um, that looks about right for these trees. And, you know, when they first planted those trees, first built the subdivision, they were not big enough to be causing enough of a shade problem to do this to the grass. But now they are. That happens so much, you know, that you hit that 15 to 20 year mark on a, on a new uh, house, new uh, subdivision, new commercial development, when the landscaping starts to mature, trees start to get bigger. All of a sudden, all that area that could grow grass 10, 15 years ago, there's too much shade there. And you have to start thinking about other things. So now when I uh, think about 
the uh, relative shade tolerance in warm season grasses, Bermuda grasses are still the worst, and they always will be the worst as a group. However, I think sometime in the near future, we'll probably have some shade tolerant Bermudas that will overlap with uh, the seashore past palums. Centipede and soja grass, in, 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 in my mind, I call these legacy varieties, but the old varieties. So things that came out before about 2000, um, the zoysia grasses that came out before about 2000, I still lump in with centipede. And then the newer zoysia grasses, they're pretty much right in there with the St. Augustine grasses in terms of their relative shade tolerance. Uh, but it is still definitely possible, uh, as that picture shows, I'll throw it up there again, to have areas where there's just not enough light to grow any turf grass. And that's where you have to get creative. So this is just a recap of, of the numbers there. Um, you know, you, it is possible if you have the money to do crazy stuff. So this is Hard Rock Stadium. And these are two of our former uh, turf grass student interns who were interning there a couple of years ago. Um, they have this roof over the seating area. Um, that stadium didn't always used to have it. It's a Bermuda grass field. And um, when they renovated the stadium and put in that roof, they also put in uh, at the ground level, field level uh, on the stadium wall, uh, these large power supplies for a dedicated circuit for putting grow lights on. And they actually have portable there. I didn't have a, uh, they, they weren't actually, these are not actually plugging into the grow lights here and then the grow lights out when I was visiting, but they've got um, these racks of just LED uh, grow lights that they can move around um, and they have outlets for them all around the outside of the field so they can move them all around the field wherever they need a little bit of extra light. So if you're made of money, there are ways to compensate um, for shade, but most of us are not an NFL team. And so we have to think about designing the landscape so that we only put the grass where there's enough light for the grass to grow, right? So here's a nice example of that. We, we've all, we all see this to a certain degree where right underneath a cluster of trees, we're going to have shade tolerant shrubs, azaleas or whatever. We're going to have a different ground cover than turf grass uh, in the shady areas. And again, as the trees grow, this might have to creep out some as the area that actually is getting enough light to grow good turf grass shrinks. And that's okay. Even though I'm a turf grass guy, I do spend a lot of time trying to convince people not to grow turf grass in areas where it's not going to do well. And part of that is just because it feels so good when you stop beating your head against the wall. Here's a good example. This uh, tree is not too far, actually, from my office. This is Comer Hall, the main administration building of the uh, College of Ag on campus here at Auburn. And on this hillside right underneath this big old oak tree, that's not a turf grass. That's a, um, uh, a mondo grass, which is, not actually a, uh, which is not actually a turf grass. And it's uh, uh, just much better right underneath that tree. Now, there are some areas of the Comer lawn. Um, they still get a little bit of shade from that tree, but not enough during the day to completely uh, kill grass. And so we do have a nice amount of zoysia grass on the front lawn of, of the building there, but right underneath that tree, underneath the drip line, why bother? I mean, you have other things that can look good that, that aren't turf grasses, uh, so use those. And then quick, I'm uh, just going to wrap up with this reminder. It isn't always shade with trees either. Okay, this is actually my front yard, and I have these two pine trees that sit in my front yard, and they're really, they're, they're very tall, and they don't have any uh, branches for about the first 15 or 20 feet. Uh, so this area of my lawn actually gets enough light to be <clears throat> mostly Bermuda grass. We'll ignore this little patch of, of another grass in here, uh, and focus on this area right here, which is drying out from competition with the feeder roots of these trees um, for water. That's all that's happening here. So you look, as you get farther away from the trees, the grass gets greener. And um, as you get closer to the trees, within about a, maybe it's about a 15 foot radius from the trees, this grass is just getting really crispy and drying out. So grass does not just lose the competition for light with trees. It often loses, almost always loses the competition for water too. And so in Alabama, you know, if it doesn't rain for a week or so during the summertime, uh, my grass underneath my trees is going to start to dry out. Whereas the grass that's closer to the street or farther away from those trees doesn't dry out as fast. And then, so that's another thing that happens uh, with trees and competition. Okay. So uh, that's about it. There's my um, uh, contact information up there again. And 
I will go ahead and uh, turn the meeting back over uh, to Dr. A and stop sharing my screen now. Thanks a lot for uh, your attention.